want to welcome you in the place of uh, Dr. Hamby, who is in the baptistry with Levi and getting ready to be baptized. So we're going to celebrate that in just a few minutes. This week, we have, uh, well, let me start with today. There's no children's church today, all right? So children, just hang out in here. Um, there's a lot of music today. I'll just give you that little heads up. Um, there is no youth group meeting tonight. And we will, Wednesday, the softball teams will play at 6.30 and 7.30 at Peaks View Field number two. Um, RNBC is playing Beeline. This Saturday is going to be a youth yard sale from 7 a.m. to 12 noon. So come out and support the youth, buy something or bring something so we can have a yard sale. Next Sunday is probably um, a very exciting day, and Derek wanted me to make sure to tell you that we are going to celebrate Lo Loyalty Day next Sunday, and we are going to eat. So he wanted me to make sure that you knew that we were having covered dish meal. This is the first time in a long time we've had uh, Loyalty Day with the covered dish meal. Our guest speaker is Reverend Grant Carter, who is a former pastor here. Many of you all know him. And he uh, sent me an email and said, it's Pentecost Sunday. Maybe we should wear red. So if you're the kind of person that likes to do things like that, wear red next Sunday for Pentecost. Are there announcements that you have that I have missed? Okay, well then we're going to move on into our service. Um, we're going to start with the baptism, and I'm going to ask you to stand, and, we're, and uh, in your hymnal, uh, you'll find the reading for today. It's number 446, and it is baptism. We're going to start with that great celebration. Also, while you're finding that, I will tell you, I'm going to light the two candles on the table. Uh, the, the two candles are memorial candles. One candle is for those who have died serving our country, since this is Memorial Day weekend. The other candle will be in memory of those who have recently uh, suffered at the hands of gun violence in Uvalde, Texas, and in Buffalo, New York. We're going to remember those as well. So those, that's why the candles will be lit in just a few minutes. Our call to worship is called baptism, and I invite you to read the words that are in bold print. We have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like, the, like his, we will certainly be united with him. In the resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be destroyed. And we might no longer be enslaved to sin. As many of you, as many of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Would you remain standing?
as I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. So join us in singing hymn number 627, or the words will be on the screen, Victory in Jesus. Would you stand?
join me as we pray? Gracious God, we give these gifts today because you have blessed us more than we can ever express in acts or words. We thank you for your love and your grace. May these gifts today share this good news with the world and help carry that forth. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
So good to see you today, and we come to our pastoral prayer time. I know this is a holiday weekend, so I'm glad you're here today, and I know a lot of folks might be watching or watching later this week as they catch up uh, from their trips and all that this weekend brings. Uh, summer starts to feel like summer this weekend. We start to feel like we're moving into it. Uh, we do have a lot of things on the prayer list, that, a lot of needs, a lot of concerns, and a lot of concerns locally and, of course, globally, as well as nationally. We're, we're mindful of the fact that um, uh, the tornado that hit the forest area, we're praying for those folks as they deal with that, uh, and some of us know what that's like in our neighborhood. Um, and then we've, we're also mindful, of course, with the grief in Buffalo and other places, and now added to that Texas I don't know, Susie talked about that with the candles. Um, and on top of that, uh, we've got our own struggles and our own heartache and our own concerns. But this is also Memorial Day weekend, and it is a weekend we have chosen to remember uh, the separation between it and Veterans Day. Veterans Day, we honor all those who, have, who are veterans, uh, but this is where we remember those who sacrifice their lives for the freedoms that we have. And so that would make today maybe a heavy day, and you might think, goodness, that's a lot of heaviness. But this prayer will also have some gratitude, because there's always, even in the darkest of days, there is so much to be thankful for, so much that is good, even in that in Memorial Day. And that's going to be the first part of our prayer. Uh, while I am mindful that people are grieving for the losses of loved ones and the wars that have happened, or in recent conflicts in the Middle East, uh, the, the th gratitude is that we get to live here in a nation where we can worship today and we have the freedoms to speak out and have our opinion and we have a place to vote and I'm just thankful that we are here, aren't you? And that we have this. And so um, we're going to take a moment and if there is just, if you'll follow the guided prayer that I'm going to give you, you'll be okay. We're going to move from Memorial Day to other needs to gratitude. So that's what we're going to do. So let's bow and just follow the instructions as we pray. Let's, let's, let's pray. Gracious God, in the moment we have here, we want to lift up the names of anyone that we have lost in combat and in service to our nation. I am sure there are folks in this room who have had family members and others who have died, even if it was years ago, and that weighs heavy on their hearts. And so today, hear these names spoken aloud. Guys, we hear those names whispered in this congregation and some that we whisper with our hearts uh, and those that we do not know by name, but we know have given that sacrifice. We, we do lift them up, their families to you. God, there are other needs, other needs weighing heavy on our heart, people or situations. We lift those up audibly now. And so, God, we pray for Forest, Virginia, the cleanup and the destruction. We pray for Buffalo still grieving and other places still grieving, and now Texas. We do not have words to express such sorrow. We pray for personal needs, some that we might know about, surgeries and health crises, loved ones, but also needs that may be unspoken and quiet, concerns that are going on in this room that Maybe no one else knows, but the person sitting here knows and you know. We lift them up to you. Now, God, we lift up gratitude and thanksgiving. We lift up anything that we are thankful for this day. God, the beauty of prayer is that we can turn to you in our needs but may we never focus so much on the needs that we do not give thanks for the gratitude that we have in our hearts, for friends and family, for this day of worship, for each day we wake up, to the good experiences that we face, to a baptism today, beautiful music, friendship, new faces, familiar faces, uh, a gorgeous day, graduations and celebrations that have been happening all weekend. All the good, we thank you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray, and all God's people say.
All my life I've been carried by grace Don't ask me how cause I can't explain It's nothing short of a miracle I'm here I've got some blessings that I don't deserve I've got some scars, but that's how you learn It's nothing short of a miracle, I'm here I think it over and it doesn't add up I know it comes from above I've got miracles on miracles A million little miracles Miracles on miracles, count your miracles, one, two, three, four, I can't even count them all. You held me steady so I wouldn't give up. You opened doors that nobody could shut. I hope I never get over what you've done I want to live with an open heart I want to live like I know who you are I hope I never get over what you've done It's not coincidence and it's not luck I know it comes from above Miracles, miracles on miracles Count your miracles One, two, three, four I can't even count them all Miracles on miracles Million little miracles Miracles on miracles Count your miracles One, two, three, four I can't even count them all I can't even, I can't even count them all I can't even, I can't even count them all I can't even, I can't even count them all One, two, three, four I can't even count them all I can't even, I can't even count them all I can't even, I can't even count them all I can't even, I can't even count them all One, two, three, four I can't even count them all Miracles on miracles a million little miracles Miracles on miracles Count your miracles One, two, three, four I can't even count them all Miracles on miracles A million little miracles Miracles on miracles Count your miracles, one, two, three, four, I can't even count them all. One, two, three, four, I can't even count them all. Fantastic day already. Wonderful. You can follow the screen or in your Bibles. I'm going to read. Um, this is our last sermon in Daniel. And uh, it's I'm going to read from chapter 9. Next week, as Susie said, is Loyalty Day. And so this summer we'll be doing something different. But we're going to wrap up today. And we're coming to a good place considering the weekend. And so we'll look at Daniel chapter 9. I'm going to read the first 11 verses. 
In the first year of Darius, king of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who is made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord and pleaded with him in prayer and petition and fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our ancestors, and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far in all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. We and our kings, our princes, and our ancestors are covered with shame, Lord, because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God and kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we pray that this ancient prayer will speak to us this weekend as we think about your love and grace and as we consider justice. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. A pastor wrote about a conversation that he as a young boy had when he was a kid with an old farmer in South Carolina. This farmer told him as a young boy that he did not believe Europe existed, that it was fiction, couldn't exist, couldn't be there. He believed there's no such place as Europe. He found it hard that anything was on the other side of the ocean. But in 1918, this farmer received his papers from Uncle Sam, was drafted into the army, and had the opportunity to firsthand see Europe. And he came back and he told this boy, you wouldn't believe what lies over there. Now, we might disbelieve that someone wouldn't ex believe that something like that existed, but there was a time and a place where folks could not imagine anything other than the holler or the spot of land they had lived their lives. And so such a story sounds like fantasy, but I've actually spoken to someone who didn't believe that we landed on the moon and could not believe that it, they believed it was filmed in Arizona. Sometimes folks just can't believe it till they see it. I honestly believe that if we were honest, that there are many of us who sometimes feel that way about things we preach and sing about. Heaven sounds wonderful, but to some it may sound unbelievable, and some do not accept it because it just seems so far out of our experience. Some can't accept God because that too feels like something just beyond understanding. And they're right, it is beyond understanding. So what we talk about God can be difficult if you, did not, if you were not raised in church and even if you were raised in church. I mean, we talk about how God's going to make things right, how evil will lose, how peace is coming. And we who believe this and believe in Jesus, even we struggle with accepting that one day, one day, there will be no more shootings announced on our televisions, no more wars and rumors of war, and no more things to terrify us. Such a thing sounds too good to be true. Until we see it, we might not believe it. Well, our series on character ends today, and we're using the Old Testament book of Daniel, exploring the DNA of character or what you'd put into the recipe to make character. And if character is who we are and that our deeds should flow from it as Christians, we want to have a Christian character. And so just in a quick review, we've talked about conviction, that our beliefs that come when we follow God, they have to be lived and lived out loud. We've talked about integrity. We must have a moral grounding, a moral compass to live out our faith. We've talked about courage. We've got to be, have the guts to do what we believe. And last week we talked about trust, that it really does come down, do we trust God and do we trust ourselves as followers of God? Well, it's time to land this plane. And the final character trait I want to talk about from Daniel is justice. And I believe all the things we've talked about, if they happen, what can result is justice. If we have those things in place, our character can produce 
justice. And that also sounds hard to believe. On a visit to Scotland, General Ulysses S. Grant was shown a new game that was now taking off, and he had never heard of it. It was a new game. Perhaps you've heard of it. Golf. Uh, he wanted to know what golf was all about, and so his host showed him at the club and the ball and the tee. The problem was the host was not really a golfer. He was trying to demonstrate something of which he could not do himself to someone who had never seen it. That's not easy. So the host placed a ball on a tee and swung, and because he wasn't a golfer, he missed it and tore up some grass. He tried again and tore up some grass, and he kept doing it and kept hitting the turf. Finally, Grant shouted, There seems to be a fair amount of exercise in this game, but I failed to see the purpose of the ball. Maybe you feel that way when you golf. Anybody amen that? So when we talk about justice, is it possible? Is it, do we find ourselves just swinging into the turf and missing the ball, wondering what the point of it all is? I agree with Dr. King who said the arc of the universe bends towards justice. But if you've got to remember the full quote is that it is a long arc. It's not a quick one. And so I want to figure out what Daniel has to say about justice. Now, chapter 9 is not the last chapter, if you're counting, but it's where we're going to end. But I think it's a good example of the last few chapters. And I'll mention 12 a little bit, but it kind of summarizes up where we want to go. It's a good place to conclude. Because the book of Daniel is showing us, and I talked about this last week, but let me also remind you. The book of Daniel is showing us that the la who has the last word, who gets the last word. And as I've said, hopefully more than once, do not forget that God gets the last word and I say this often because we need to make sure we put this in our heart. As a parent, I know that my kids don't like me to have the last word. I don't know. Your kids are probably better behaved than mine, but my children like to get the last word. Anybody ever had that experience? And while they may not realize it, I actually have lived long, and they do know that. They remind me of that. But I have learned a few things along the way. I'm not totally a dinosaur. But don't we do the same thing to God? We treat God the way most teenagers treat their parents, as if we're clueless and don't have any knowledge of the real world. And we think that God really isn't in connection with us, and we surely know what God should do. And so we need to remember how powerful God is and, and how wonderful God is and how mighty God is, and that God being God means God gets the last word. And I'm glad of that, because I really don't know what's best. And I really don't have all the solutions. And I think it's good news that there is a God above me. Aren't you glad there is a God who is above you? Aren't you glad that God is God and we have this God in our lives? Now, we talked in this journey about the three great stories of Daniel. And we talked about what all happened, how the Hebrews were hauled into captivity. But even in that, they did not sell out. We talked about how they remained faithful even in front of a fire and a lion's den. And we talked about the dreams and visions of the book, and last week we looked at one of those. And the main thing you can take from all this weird language is that empires come, and empires think that they are having the last word, and empires think they are the ultimate word, but that empires always go. And there's a whole list of empires that tried to defeat Israel, and did for a while, and they are no more. So if God gets the last word, that means God, in the end, however that happens, that in the end, God wins the day. And so Daniel does what we all need to do in this chapter today. He comes to God with that in his mind. He looks, at the, up, he looks at the messed up realities of his world, and we can learn from it. As we complain and lament the troubles of our day, and boy, can we, they are long. Have we, in, in any of this, do we ever come to God in that struggle? And I don't say that to be pious or have easy answers. But there is a spiritual dimension and reality to life. Because if God is real and the followers of God, are, if we are the followers of God, then we know that there's got to be more to this life than simply paying the bills, finishing our to-do lists, and punching the clock. And you're here on Memorial Day weekend, a beautiful day after a nasty day Friday. You're here today because I think somehow, in some way, we all sense that. That we want the more. That we want God. And I believe that God wants to move in your life, and not just this moment, but every moment. God wants to be a part of your Monday. God wants to be a part of your struggles and trials. God wants to be a part of your successes and your failures. God wants to be an active part of all that makes you you. And so Daniel knows this, and he prays. And he pours out his heart to God. Now he's talking about a situation with a Persian king. The book of Daniel jumps back and forth between the Babylonians and the Persians. And I'm not giving you a history lesson, so a history test after this, so you don't need to worry about that. 
But Daniel is talking about a time where the people needed God, and he has studied the scriptures written by Jeremiah, and he feels led to call to, to come to God. And you'll notice his prayer is one of confession. He isn't attacking God. He's confessing his sin and the sins of the people. He places blame where it belongs, that the Hebrews have suffered because of their sin. They have turned from God, and, that, and all that Daniel has experienced is a result of a constant rebellion that is within the human heart. They frankly were not listening to the God who loved them, They would not listen to God. They had turned a deaf ear to God. They had turned away from God. And the language is strong and clear. And as a result of that, he feels shame, loss, and the results of it all. God is righteous, he believes, but there are consequences to sin. And he describes the results of that, and it's all rebellion. But here's the good news. Despite the rebellion, despite the hard-headedness, he is clear. God is always faithful. And I hope you get that, that God has always been faithful. They are not alone. God hears our cries for rescue. And when you go home and you think about the problems of the day, God is still present with us. And the good news is while we don't listen to God, God does always listen to us and God hears. God loves us in spite of ourselves. God hears our prayers. We hear in this prayer, I would say chapter 7, verse 19 is probably the best verse for you to go home and check out. But in that verse you hear, O Lord, listen, O Lord, forgive, O Lord, hear and act. Imagine if we could hear that, if we could think about that. Now I, like you, think that sometimes I'd like the answers to my prayers to come a little faster. And Daniel is praying, and then an angel visits Gabriel, and he talks to God and reminds him that God's going to answer. And he describes God's plan for rescuing the Hebrews, that the exile is ending. And let me pause there and say, for us who say, why can't God answer our prayers a little quicker? God is answering their prayer after 70 years. Now, I don't know about you, but 70 years is no drop in the bucket. And so God has never moved fast, it seems. But still, even though it may take a while, God is going to answer. Judah, who have been exiled, will return. And you can go home and read Ezra and Nehemiah about how God gets them rescued and gets them home and they have to rebuild the temple and the city walls and how despite all that opposed them, they were not wiped out of history. And we as Christians get a little bit more excited and the speed picks up because we know the whole book of the Bible. Uh, The New Testament tells us about Jesus and the hope that we find in Jesus. Now, If you read these chapters, there's a lot of confusion and a lot of things, but please know this, it's quite clear that history has a destination. That there are dark days, but at some point, God has taken us somewhere. Now, after this return from the exiles, we've talked about how there will always be another empire to kick them. Even when they get rid of the Babylonians and the Persians, they're going to deal with the Greeks, and we know in the New Testament they're going to deal with the Romans. I want to give you a little history side note and then bring this home to you and me today. Uh, the chapter that I read to you talks about a phrase called the abomination that causes desolation. That is a meaty sentence. Um, There is an event that will happen, not in the Bible, but there was an event in Greek history and Jewish history that this alludes to, and the people uh, who experienced that moment know what he's talking about. There was the darkest moment in this Greek occupation was when the temple was desecrated uh, by Antigonus Epiphanes IV. This Greek emperor would go into the Holy of Holies and slaughter a pig all over the altar of God, which was an offense in so many ways. And so it's kind of like the folks in Ukraine who see their cities weighed waste. Can anything get worse than this? Or the folks in Texas or Buffalo. There are moments in human history where it's just rock bottom and we can't even imagine anything worse. And even in those moments we're being told through the scriptures, even in the darkest moments of the Spirit, God is there. And if we don't believe that, then what hope can we have? I have to believe God is with us. And I have to believe that the bullies never win, that evil doesn't win. And so all of Daniel is trying to say that somehow in ways we cannot fathom, there is a God at work and there is a destination. If life is a vehicle, we got to be headed somewhere. There has to be meaning to the world. So what is that destination, preacher? Well, here's the good news. The destination is God. God is doing all God can to bring you and me into fullness of love with God. 
to say that that would mean that God is in control, that God is boss, that God has the last, the last word. What that says to me is that evil will not win and darkness will not win. Death and defeat do not give the conclusion. God has the epilogue. God has the coda. God has the summary. God is where this thing is going. And that, my friends, I hope is good news to you. Let me quickly say, that does not make us passive and off the hook. We don't get baptized like Levi did today and sit in a pew and wait for the bus to heaven to pick us up. We have a whole lot of work to do. God, if God is the destination and we are being called to go to God, then that means we are to become the hands and feet of Jesus Christ until we are in the presence of God. We are not off the hook. If we believe this, that is our convictions. If we live this, this will take integrity and courage. And if we know this, it's going to take trust in God. We have work to do. We are to be the peacemakers, the hands and feet. We've got to get out there. God is calling us to be the people we say we are. Mickey Mantle hit a lot of home runs. But if you've ever thought about this, he also struck out a lot. He once said, quote, Look, fellas, every batter knows he's going to strike out so many times every week. I just go up there and do my best. And if I strike out, I know that that's one down for this week, and I'm just that much closer to a hit or a homer. We will not be successful in everything we do as a church or as individuals. We will not wipe out every spot of evil in our community and world, but we will do a lot of good if we get out of the pews. If we will work, and we will work hard, God will bless us. Let me say this as I close with a word of hope in just a moment. I don't even, I didn't even rehearse what I want to say in light of the tragedies of this week because I can't do it anymore. I can't talk about these things like I did when I was sitting in a waiting room in the late 90s waiting on my father to die of cancer and the TV screen showed me a town I never heard of called Columbine. time this happens. Surely good people will do something. I don't know what that something is, but surely. I think my heart was completely shattered at Newtown when I put my kids the same age into school the next day. So I don't have any answers. I just don't. But I have hope. I believe there are more good people than bad people. I believe the churches in Buffalo are worshiping Jesus Christ today in, this, in face of terrible, terrible loss. I don't walk away from the church and say there's no God because this happens. Because I look at Ukraine, and the minute the bombs weren't falling, they filled the churches full, you can see the pictures, full to praise God and sing the same hymns we sang. Ask them about faith. I guess what helps me, and I'll try to say this without crying, I guess what helps me is that my dad died at 52. And when he died, I was so mad at God. But then I looked at him. He was the one dying, and his faith was so strong, and he was at peace, and he just wanted us to know he loved us, and he was okay, and he was going to be all right. And I was so angry. And then I thought, but he should be angry, not me. But his faith was so strong. And he didn't question. I mean, he had his moments. Everybody does. But he knew in the God he had trusted as a child in some little church in Kentucky. And so I thought to myself, who am I? I mean, I hope that makes sense. So I don't get it. And I never will. And I know you can turn on the TV and the computer today and everybody's going to tell you what we need to do. And yes, we do need to do some things and we need to talk about it. But end of the day, Monday's coming. And you're going to get out of bed and you're going to go to work. Well, you're not tomorrow, it's Memorial Day, but Tuesday. You're going to go to work. You're going to go to school. You're going to go out into the community. And we are responsible to live the love of Jesus in all those places. And we are responsible to teach these kids and these youth that there is more. And that's what we'll do. And we'll look for ways to help these people. And we'll look for ways to volunteer and to help. But I believe, I got a dear friend who says, Derek, 
Are you still that optimistic guy? He's always testing me because he's, he's got a pretty gloomy view of things. He said, are you sure? And, and when I complain, he says, I thought you were optimistic. And I said, I am, and I still believe. And I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. And I know that it is not in vain. One day, God wins. Love. There's a woman who's buried under a 150-year-old live oak tree in a cemetery in Louisiana. And the woman only wanted one word carved on her tombstone, just one. And so they say if you go there, you're going to find a tombstone. It's not going to have a biography on it of achievements and goals. It's not going to tell you how great she is or probably not even her name and her birth date and death date. Because there's only one word on that tombstone. And that one word is waiting. So in a sense, we could tattoo on our hearts or our bodies, if you want, the word waiting. We wait, but here we close. Are you ready? We wait, but we work while we wait. We wait for justice, but we work daily, every day, to be instruments of justice in this world. If someone doesn't have a voice, we're there for them. If someone has a need, we're there for them. We do everything we can to be people of justice. We wait for righteousness, but we work every day to make sure this world is as right as we can in the ways we can. We wait for light, but we become the light in someone's darkness to help somebody who needs to know that God is love and that we love them. We wait for mercy, but we live mercy. We forgive people who don't really deserve it, or we don't always say what we think we want to say because we know Jesus forgives and we should too. Make no mistake, I do not believe our waiting is pointless. I do believe that we wait, but we wait not in vain. So thank God for your church. Thank God for your friends. Thank God for the Spirit who pulls us together, and we will continue to work. Next week we celebrate our history. I forgot to look up how old we are as a church. I'll try to tell you next week. For some, you're older than you want to be, and you're younger than you want to be, depending on the year. What is it? 62? So for some, if I say you're 62, that's good news, and for others, that's bad news. You take it however you want. But for 60-plus years, this church has been an instrument of light in Amherst County. And if the Lord tarries we got, and for 60 more years, we will continue to be that light. And good things are happening at RNBC, and good things are happening, more importantly, in this community, state, and world because of this church. So join it. 66. You're even older. I'm sorry. So join us. Let's feed some people. Let's love some neighbors. Let's help some strangers. Let's meet some real needs. Let's share some grace. Let's teach some kids this year in vacation Bible school. Let's go visit some hospitals and some homebound people. Let's go tell people they are loved by God and that we love them too. And in that, we will bring justice. As a closure, I know this is Memorial Day. And it is a day where we remember those who gave their lives in wars and other times. They died. And guess what? They didn't see the completion of their sacrifice, but they didn't hesitate to do their part to make sure that we would see that. And that is what we do. We work until we gather on the other side of the Jordan. And one day, sweet, one sweet day, we will be in the presence of God and we will see that fullness and that victory and that love complete. But don't give up till that day. Be a part of the solution and never the part of the problem. Let's move forward with faith. Let's pray. Gracious God, as we close this time together, you are a good and gracious God. The songs we sing matter. The prayers we pray matter. The lives we live matter. May we go out and just love people even more. And this week, we need a little bit more love. So may we be instruments of that love. May we love so much that we annoy everyone. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, God, our Father, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. And all God's people say, amen. We're going to stand to our feet and sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. Uh, Levi's testimony in baptism stands before you. If you want to follow through in baptism or faith in Christ or join our church, I'll be at the front to meet you.
We thank you for joining us in worship, and as Susie said at the beginning, next week's going to be a very special Sunday. Last year, we had Loyalty Day. We didn't get to eat. We had to send them out to eat, or Lincoln had to feed them. I can't remember which, but maybe it was a little of both. Uh, and the year before, we were on video, so aren't you excited? There's something about fried chicken and Baptist, so hey, I think that has got to happen. I'm excited to see Grant. I know he's retired now, so it'll be great to see him, and uh, it'll be a great worship service. I pray this week is a good one for you. Give thanks for the music. Amen. What a fantastic sound. We've got a Bible for Levi. I'll give him on my way out. I'm proud of Levi, and uh, I just pray that his testimony will ring true this day. Let us close in prayer. Gracious God, as we leave this place to go to the places you take us, thank you for your love and your grace. Thank you so much for Levi's decision, and we celebrate with him what a witness he bears to us of the love of Jesus Christ. It is in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit we pray, and all God's people say.